Welcome back to The Pulse, your weekly guide to global health. In the rich world, measles is largely a thing of the past, thanks to widespread vaccination. But in the developing world, measles is still a killer, and it hits young kids hardest. The good news is that measles vaccination is on the rise. Almost 200 million kids will get their shots, thanks to an international initiative. But reaching them all means getting the measles vaccine to some of the most remote, poor and war-torn places on the planet. So is wiping out measles a realistic prospect or just another false promise? Sarah wasn't vaccinated against measles because she'd had a touch of baby eczema. She was five and three quarters. We went to pick her up from school on the Friday afternoon, met at the school gate with her teacher who said, I think Sarah's going to have the measles. And I just said very complacently, well, if she's not in school on Monday, you'll know why. Sarah Clough is now 35. She's both mentally and physically handicapped. The measles attacked her brain and led to encephalitis. This has left Sarah permanently brain damaged and dependent on others. Good girl. Good girl. Is the car open, Peter? Her whole body, her, literally her whole body was smothered with measles so badly that it did attack her brain. She was in a coma for eight weeks. It was on the Sunday morning that the rash ap appeared and uh, we sent for the doctor for him to confirm that it was measles. And he said, oh my goodness, that's a marvelous case of measles that is, but don't worry about her, she'll be okay. She'll start getting better now the rash has come out. And uh, then in front of our very eyes, she started slipping away. And she was in a coma before we knew where we were. Oh, hello, Tango. He's so soft, isn't he? Okay. Well, initially, Sarah was blind, completely blind. She couldn't hear at all. She didn't know anybody. She had no memory at all of having been ill. Um, and it was just as though we'd got a different child to what we had when she went into the hospital. She's also got what they call muscular hypertonia, which is where the muscles lose their tone completely. And that's what makes her very, very floppy. Walks like a little rag doll. Sarah doesn't like the way she is at all. She's very aware that she's different to her sister and to the people and, and the friends who she had before her illness. She's extremely aware. She gets very upset that she's like this. She doesn't want to be like this. Yet Sarah is one of the lucky few. Without access to sophisticated Western healthcare, measles would have killed her, just as it kills tens of thousands of children throughout the developing world. Turobova Kalida lives in the Central Asian Republic of Tajikistan. She has three children and has been unable to get any of them vaccinated. When the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, Tajikistan gained independence, but it came at a high price. A five-year civil war led to 50,000 deaths. The infrastructure collapsed and the health system crumbled with it. In 2003, more than 400,000 children in Central Asia missed out on life-saving jabs. At the same time, here in the Zogd region of Tajikistan, there were repeated measles epidemics. 400 people were hospitalized. Measles vaccination is now happening here because of a mass campaign coordinated by the government with support from UNICEF, the World Health Organization and other partners. UNICEF's Umeda Sadikova and Dr. Tarek Hussein are heading out into the field. They're going to the northern Sogd region to monitor the vaccinations because nothing on this scale has ever been tried before. This measles mass campaign is the first campaign since the country gained independence in 1991. 
and we are going to immunize approximately 3 million children between 1 to 18 years old. Before the independence, uh, vaccine supply was well established and after the getting independence, uh, the supply was cut and uh, people couldn't vaccinate their children. One of the biggest challenges is delivering vaccines. This road is uh, the only road which connects uh, our capital, Dushanbe, with the northern part of the country, with the soft region. And uh, this is uh, the only way through which we transport our vaccines and syringes to that part of the country. To wipe out measles, 90% of the population must be vaccinated. At last, Umeida and Tarek arrive in Aini. This is the main hospital in the area, and with 350 beds, is one of the biggest in Tajikistan. And we are here to see the immunization session. We will talk to doctors, we will check the vaccines, and we will talk with them if they need any additional support from us. In the vaccination storeroom, Tarek takes a look at the batch numbers and expiry dates. Umeda checks that the correct records are being kept. Today they're on their way to set up in the local school. Schools are ideal places to give the jabs as the children are already on site. The library is quickly converted into a clinic. The vaccinators have syringes that can only be used once, but they still have to be handled very carefully. These syringes is one of the safest syringes because it's auto disable. So once you use one time, you have to throw that one. There is no way you can use second time. So it, actually this way you prevent the infection from one child to another child. The children start to line up. Every pupil gets an injection. Parents also bring in youngsters who are not at the school anxious that they don't miss out. Many are older than five, the age by which measles vaccination would normally have been given. And these children at the time were small children and they were not vaccinated in time. So now they are falling into the category of susceptible people. That's why they have to be vaccinated during this campaign. Turabova Kalida makes the journey to the school. She has brought all three of her children. After each jab, the needles are carefully disposed of. At the end of the day, the boxes themselves must be destroyed. All it takes is petrol and a match. Measles vaccination works and it's cheap. The challenge is getting to the places that need it most. Back in England, the hunt is on for a way to improve measles vaccination. Dr. David Brown works for the UK's Health Protection Agency and, with the World Health Organization, is trying to find an alternative to syringes. We've had a safe and effective live attenuated vaccine for more than 30 years now. And um, despite that um, assessment in 2002, it's still the case that there are up to 700,000 cases of measles dying in the world. The majority of these deaths are in developing countries like Tajikistan where syringes pose two challenges. The first is that misused they can spread disease and the second is that syringes may not be the best way to defeat measles. A better method might be to learn from the measles virus itself. It spreads through the air and attacks at the back of the throat and this could be its weak point. For 20 years, scientists have been trying to devise a vaccine that can be given orally. But it's not been a straightforward task. Pioneering work was done in Mexico testing a jet nebulizer. A paper cone was placed over the child's mouth and the vaccine pressurized until it became an aerosol. It had some serious faults. 
The device needed a power-operated compressor. It also had to be kept cold during use, and the mouthpiece had to be stored on ice. All this complicated and power-hungry technology would be unusable in the field. Worse, it was discovered that the vaccine became inactive and ineffective during its use. It was back to the drawing board. After years of research, this is the latest prototype. It looks much more promising. So it actually works by the vaccine being in the container at the top of this device. Um, and you have a vibrating mesh through which the vaccine uh, liquid is pushed. Um, and because of the pore size, uh, you can see that uh, the liquid is turned into an aerosol uh, of these small droplets, uh, which can then be inhaled. The new model has many advantages. Well, one of the potential advantages is that the damage done to the virus uh, is much less using this mechanism for generating the aerosol than the pressure that you put it under in the jet nebulizer. So hardly any training is needed. It's extremely portable and there is very little waste. There is still a long way to go as the device is still being trialled but this could be a big step towards saving hundreds of thousands of young lives. That's all for this edition, but join us again next time on The Pulse.